call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum tonight. <clears throat> uh, we're expecting one more of our board members uh, in uh, at any moment, which means we can't do the minutes until he arrives. And so we can go on to public comment. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to make any public comment? Mr. Atwood. I'm Jeff Atwood, 146 North Williston Road. I'm sure the board knows why I'm here. The topic <clears throat> affordable housing, the lack of it, still another year. What are you building right now over there? What are you building, Mr. McGuire? What's being built over there right now? You don't know what's being built at the growth center? What's being built? I'm sorry, this, this is your time to talk. It's not time for- uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions, sir. <laughs> it's really up to the board to decide whether well, they so want to dialogue. Okay, what are you building right now in the so front? So uh, if we had the uh, planning director here, he'd be able to tell you exactly what we're building. Are uh, you building, so are you building any perpetually affordable homes now? I don't sir? know that at the moment. So you why don't, don't you just that? give me your comments and then we can uh, pass those on to the you planning You said you don't director. know that? That's what you know. just said, right? I do not know that I've doing anything. You're building none. You're building Pardon zero. Me? Zero for ownership, sir. You're building no perpetually affordable homes. I do for not ownership. know that, so go ahead with your comments. Okay. Joyce. Joyce, excuse me. Remember when they came last time? Mm -hmm. I don't trust these guys. Because for 10 years, okay, they haven't built any. If you read chapter five, what's the, that's what they're supposed to be building. Nothing over there in that growth center is for those children in the schoolyards around here. The head of your DRB has enriched himself by tens of millions of dollars. Okay? What did the town of Williston get? What did we get out of it? Did we get any housing for those gentlemen over there? Did we get any housing for that young man and his young lady? They can't afford a single house in that growth center. Everything is 300,000 to 450. Rents are 1875 for two bedrooms, 1600 for a single. What is going on around here? It's beyond ridiculous. It's beyond being embarrassing. It's disgraceful, it's shameful. You have an affordable housing task force in which there are members in the room here that were on it. They report to a state legislator. You go study it for a weekend retreat. You tell those kids why you haven't built any affordable housing in that growth center. When you've got a member in this town government that was on that task force that handed it to you and you built none. That doesn't add up to me. That doesn't make any sense. You're a state legislator. Something's not right. I don't do well when things aren't right. What are you about? What are you about, sir? You're a hypocrite. I'm not gonna bother to answer that. It doesn't deserve an answer. It does deserve an answer because that's what you have for evidence. You study affordable housing, you take it and you look at it for a weekend, and then you allow a man in the group to build and not ask him or require to build any affordable housing? That's the truth. People of power abusing it, giving it to themselves, self-interest, self-serving, self-centered, a slap in the face to the state of Vermont, a slap in the face to us as residents, people that care about the youth, people that care about this demographic problem. We're in a mess. I thought the town of Williston was historic and led. There's no leaders here, just a bunch of followers. Following the bully. Letting the bully enrich his pocketbook by tens of millions. And no one stood up and said, what about our kids? What about the men and women that are serving us? It's not hard. You see this right here, it's a pamphlet. In it is the Champlain Housing Trust agreement that they have with me and my wife. We have seven perpetually affordable homes in Richmond. You know what they're doing? They're providing hope, they're providing opportunity, and they're showing these young kids that we care. How about a little challenge? How many can you and your professionals, 
your millionaire professionals build? Huh? My wife and I, how about a little challenge? How many can you build town of Williston? Huh? It's not hard. Just got to have a willingness. Got to believe in it. Got to believe in the people. Got to believe in what it represents. It's not hard. Esquire Kinney. Welcome. 500 some odd units to zero perpetually affordable. Are those just numbers, sir? Are those just? Are they equal opportunity? Does someone have the opportunity to buy a perpetually affordable home in this town right now? How long has it been? They've never had the opportunity. Over 12 years since I've been here. That's equal opportunity? You've got an inclusive club over there. It's disgraceful. And it's going to catch up to you sooner or later. If I don't get you, history's going to get you. And it's going to be harsh on you. You had a chance to enrich hundreds of young families' lives with perpetual homes that would have forever been affordable for your children. Ones that are in the first grade, ones that are coming out of college, ones that are in the sixth grade, and ones that aren't even born. I guarantee you this much, okay, of all the kids that are in that school system, 20 to 30% of them are gonna say, mom and dad, I wanna work here and I wanna live here. And you've got nothing for them. Those are dead end streets down there. Nothing. You've lost 3% to 5% interest rates. You knew because Dana Hood came and told you what you had to do to achieve it. It was interest rates and it was speed. And you sat back idly for five, six years. You believe in $15 an hour, sir? How about two young kids falling in love, making $15 an hour, having a youngster, if they had 200 perpetually affordable homes in there at $600 to $800 a month, they could live there and they could walk to work. You're a hypocrite. It's going to get you. But it'll never, never, ever make up for what you've done and how you've devastated, devastated the opportunity for young families and the children in this community to have a home. That's on your conscience, and that's going to be your legacy. It's never leaving. People are going to drive by it forever. That's yours. You earned it. I wish to heck I could have turned it around sooner. Not for me. It was never about me. It was about the state that I love, about the people that I love, and not my children, because I don't have any, but the children in this state that I love, that I've built schools for, that I've built their ski areas, I've built their hospitals. I could go on and on. I'd come here every Tuesday if my wife would let me. But I do love to come here, because you're on the wrong side of it, and you're on the wrong side of history. You enjoy that. By the way, let's not forget about the little challenge, okay? All right? I want his job. That's what I want. I've said that for years now. Excuse me. The all of you on a nice holiday. I appreciate your service, okay? I'm fighting for you. Trust me. Is there any other person who wishes to make any public comment tonight? If not, then we'll move back to the minutes of November 20th, 2018. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Well, if Jeff has a second, <coughs> sorry. Okay, keep going. Nope. Page so one. Jeff has a second. I'll second. All right. Page one. That's the longest second. <laughs> Hang on, page one. If not, page two. Just add one thing under item number 10, the manager's report under the second bullet 
where it talks about the finance director, and she'll be leaving Williston. I think it should read it should be leaving her position in Williston. Okay. Uh, right. I was tempted to ask for an amendment on uh, item six about the state transportation presentation, and I reminded them that they've come any number of years saying that the surf alternatives are just around the corner. But I, I yeah. think the minutes are finally about. So, so it's a long, long corner. Yeah, it is a very, very long <laughs> corner. That's great. Anything else on page two? Page three. Hearing no other corrections, all those in favor of approving the minutes of November 20th, 2018, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And one abstention, Joy. And now we'll move on to something that you really like to, to see, and that's uh, a presentation of the Ambulance Service of the Year Award from the Department of Health. Mr. Batesy is here to make that uh, presentation, and Chief Morton and many members of the fire department are here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for making time at this exciting meeting tonight. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I won't be nearly as dramatic, um, but nonetheless, I think I have a very important uh, topic to bring up. Um, every May, we uh, at the Department of Health, uh, in honor of uh, Emergency Medical Services Week, uh, select uh, a series of award winners. Uh, both services and providers are nominated uh, throughout the state. Uh, and are vetted and selected by a panel made up of emergency medical services team members uh, out of our office. Um, traditionally, these were awarded at a ceremony at the uh, state capitol, but we decided two years ago to uh, begin to give them out in places like this uh, because, uh, frankly, standing in front of the capitol with no legislators in session didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and I think it makes a lot more sense to stand among you uh, so you can hear the great work that's being done uh, by your public safety professionals here. Um, so it is my pleasure to be here tonight and to uh, let you know that uh, Williston Fire Department has been selected as the Ambulance Service of the Year. We have 177 services in Vermont that uh, do the work of, uh, uh, <laughs> do, do a great amount of work on your behalf and on behalf of the ill and injured people uh, throughout the state. Uh, and um, Williston Fire Department has been a leader among those services. Uh, they were nominated and selected this year uh, because of that leadership, because of uh, the model they provide for other services in the system. Uh, and I can speak from my own personal experience that they have been uh, early adopters of, uh, of measures like high performance CPR. And, and as you know, I was here not long ago awarding a heart safe community to you as well, uh, made great strides uh, for us both for the, for the community of Williston, but also for the system as a whole, because as services like Williston go, so do other services that come in behind them. So they've, we've relied heavily upon them to serve in that mentoring role. Um, but not just uh, in, the, in the area of cardiac arrest, certainly in lots of other areas. Members of their team have uh, worked diligently with our office to help us with training projects, uh, whether it be warm zone, uh, EMS tactical, training, whether it be uh, a variety of other projects as well, uh, we've uh, consistently uh, found great support uh, from them. Um, uh, not only that, and the reason they were nominated most of all is because of the work they do here in your community. Uh, they have uh, consistently provided excellent patient care. They've consistently provided uh, a level of training above and beyond uh, what is expected of us. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, have been true mo uh, models of, of emergency medical services. So on behalf of the Department of Health uh, and uh, on behalf of the Commissioner, uh, I would like tonight to, provide, to present Chief Morton and his team with uh, the Ambulance Service of the Year. It does say May 2018 because we've awarded it in, uh, during EMS week, but uh, uh, it is for the whole year. So. Uh, congratulations, and uh, again, thank you very much for all of you. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> it will go without saying that uh, we are, of course, thrilled to receive this award and, and, and very happy to be recognized by our peers and by the State Health Department. Uh, and it's a team effort. We have a number of us in the room tonight and spouses of us and children of us in the room tonight. And I think it, it communicates down the line, not just the people on the fire department, but, but those in EMS, those who support us, those that do the fire work. And I want to recognize Tony particularly in that Tony has performed much of our um, EMS supplying and some of our policy making. And Tony's been kind of a real cog in making sure the EMS moves forward appropriately. And Tony has shifted and the shift Lieutenant Keith Baker have done a great job. So I want to recognize all the firefighters, EMTs in the department, some that can't be here tonight, Tony particularly, and thank the board for all of your support throughout the years to allow us to move forward. As you know, this year we've hit, we, we became a paramedic service, and, uh, and that, that's been a great uh, enhancement for the town and for protection of the citizens. And the system as well. Thank you. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the board, thank you to all the members of the fire department who made this award possible for us in town. <clears throat> we don't deserve the credit you guys do, but, uh, and the ladies do too. So thank you. Thank you. Take care. <clears throat> Let's move on to the uh, appointment of the person to serve on the Social Organizations Committee. The recommendation is that Jim Thornton be um, uh, appointed tonight to that committee. Um, in the past, the person who has served as our town uh, service officer has also served uh, on that committee. And there's other um, uh, vacancies for that uh, committee as well. So with that, uh, if there's, unless there's questions, I would appreciate a motion. Move to appoint James Thornton to the Social Organizations Committee. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Thank you. And we'll move then on to the Lake Champlain Chamber of Commerce. Old friend of mine, Tom Torty, who's the president and CEO of the Lake Champlain Chamber of Commerce, is here tonight to give us a breakdown, a uh, little bit of history of perhaps of where we're at um, okay. as we just joined. Well, I certainly won't be uh, as exciting as the last two in any <laughs> number of ways. And I guess I can clear a room <clears throat> with the best of them. But uh, so the town manager asked me uh, at your request to come in and talk about economic development um, in the region, in the state, what we're seeing and what we're doing. And I'll give you a kind of a very brief synopsis of uh, what we do and what we're doing to address some of the challenges that we have before us as a state, as a region. And then, frankly, answer any questions you may have. These, these types of uh, interactions tend to go better when you ask me questions and I don't presuppose what it is that you want to know. So, um, and as the chair <clears throat> knows, if once I get in front of a microphone, I could talk for hours, so I will really <laughs> keep it brief. Um, the chamber's been around for 108 years. I'll give you Chamber 101, just for the heck of it. Um, uh, we do <clears throat> all of the things that uh, you expect a Chamber of Commerce to do, business after hours, events, business to business, connections, member discounts, advertising, marketing, uh, those general things that no matter where you go in the country, you'll find Chambers of Commerce doing those things. We tend to differentiate on, in four different areas uh, from other chambers of commerce uh, in the state and, frankly, others of chambers, chambers of commerce in the Northeast region. And that's on leadership development, economic development, policy advocacy, and uh, visitor services. And those are in no particular order, but those are the four pillars, strategic investment areas that our board um, a number of years ago uh, said that we wanted to focus our time and assets on and that's you know where we've been building our strategic plan and strategic capacity leadership we begin with high school programs we run a high school program called tips that is an internship and mentoring program focused on college uh, excuse me high school juniors purpose of that program is to work with the young people in the area to help them 
learn what's possible for them uh, academically and professionally in the area. We hope that they stay and should they choose to stay, what's the art of the possible. We also work with them on soft skills, how to interview, how to show up for a job, what's it like to work in an industry. And then at the end of the semester, we connect them with a business that they're interested in for a 40-hour internship mentoring program one day a week. They go in and, and shadow a business. That's been very effective. We um, have a young professional mentoring program where we take a young professional who's working in the area and uh, based on their interests, connect them with a, if you will, a seasoned executive in their field who might be able to mentor them. It's supposed to be a very short three to six month engagement and some of those have been on going on their third year where the mentor and the mentee just connect and they become friends and, and more than just a business transaction. <clears throat> we won't run the, uh, it's called Burlington Young Professionals, but it's really a regional young professionals program. Uh, again, creating for them or helping them create an ecosystem uh, so that they understand that there are people around their same age in the area trying to live here, raise families here, work here, and stay here. And that addresses some of the economic development problems I think we can, we can chat about. Um, we've run Leadership Champlain, which is a leadership development program in its 32nd year or 33rd year, I've lost track of time, and an executive leadership program. Uh, we're in the process of uh, working uh, with St. Michael's and maybe UVM to do a Leadership Champlain style program for college sophomores. The belief is when you're a freshman, you are clueless. When you're <clears throat> a junior, you think you know what you want to do. And, when you're a senior, you're on your way out. And so the sweet spot in talking to some local academics is let's focus on college sophomores. Again, the idea is let's show them what's here. Let's show them how their skills connect with what's here. Um, let's create for them connections so that if they do want to stay, they know where to apply for jobs and who to talk to. It's, again, building that ecosystem. Economic development, we run um, three programs really that fall squarely into that. We run an early stage accelerator program where in the last five years, um, the 43 companies, uh, very early stage companies that have come through, we've created over 150 jobs with $9 million in follow on capital investment in, in these companies. Um, that program is expanding in a, through a partnership with the generator in downtown Burlington. It also, for the past three years, has expanded to include a launch VT collegiate program where we work with the colleges in the state to create their own business pitch accelerator program at the colleges. They choose a winner, they go, this year it's February 22nd, and they have a college pitch off. And the winner of that college pitch off gets an automatic entry into our accelerator program with uh, all sorts of very interesting folks who do things that I honestly don't understand. When you start getting into rockets and UVM and drone technology, you've lost me. I just know that's pretty fantastic stuff. Um, we run the Northern Borders Regional Program where we try to bring economic development to the Northeast Kingdom. Although we're a regional chamber of commerce with the largest business association in the state with a statewide membership, and we have a grant from the federal government um, to try to bring advanced manufacturing into the Northeast Kingdom. And we also run the state, uh, what we call the Vermont Quebec Enterprise Initiative, which is working with companies in Quebec that are looking for a U.S. presence in order to access U.S. markets to market Vermont as a place of choice rather than Plattsburgh, New York, if I can be absolutely blunt. Um, we realized about four years ago we were getting killed by Plattsburgh in terms of uh, competing for businesses, and there's no reason why a company should choose Plattsburgh over um, Vermont. So. Those are ways that we are working in the economic development sp sphere. Um, advocacy, as Terry knows, we have two full-time, the chair, excuse me, knows, um, we have two full-time uh, advocates, lobbyists in Montpelier. We focus very strongly on policy and not on politics. Um, some years the Republicans love us, some years the Democrats love us, and every now and again the progressives like us, but at one point everyone's disliked us for the positions we've taken. Um, 
uh, we've come out in support of, uh, of minimum wage with a slow kind of ramp up to $15 an hour in minimum wage. We've supported a, a statewide fund to clean up Lake Champlain while also supporting um, marriage equality and other issues like that. So it's really hard to pin this down. We tend to look at uh, what creates a place and space uh, that people are going to want to start jobs, grow jobs, and come and live here. And it's about the it's social ecosystem as much as it's about um, the business uh, ecosystem. You know, our tagline is we support our members, uh, their employees, and our communities. And unless those three things are working in harmony, you are, you're out of balance and you're not going to grow the economy in the area. Last thing is visitor services. And we run the State Convention Bureau, so we bring meetings and conventions to the state of Vermont, whether uh, we represent all the major properties from the Equinox to the Woodstock Inn to the Hotel Vermont to the Old Sheridan. Our job is to get leads to those properties to bring meetings and conventions of all sizes uh, to come to the state of Vermont. And we're working with folks in the Burlington region um, to create a regional marketing organization funded by the major hotel properties. Um, from Burlington, South Burlington, Essex, and I believe Williston has one that will join because of their affiliation with the Marriott Group. Um, that'll be about a $300,000 a year um, marketing effort focused on bringing tourists uh, to the area, believing that if we get them as tourists, we might be able to keep them as um, residents. That's Chamber 101. Any questions on that before I talk about the challenges of economic development? Um, so the town manager said, so how come, what are our challenges? And I, I chuckled and said, same ones in um, this region as we have in the rest of the state and the same that New England and the Northeast are facing. We're, we're seeing an attrition of young people uh, leaving uh, Vermont. Or we're losing more than we're gaining, uh, despite the fact that we have a high density of universities. We're having a hard time keeping those folks here. That's no different than Maine, New Hampshire, um, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Some are doing a little bit better than us, but by and large, we're seeing an attrition of uh, young people out of, out of this area. We're seeing an influx, paradoxically, of uh, retirees coming in, which is not a bad thing, but, you know, they're not creating jobs, so they're not creating new wealth. They tend to be living on old wealth. There's nothing wrong with that, but we'd like to see a balance of old and, and young folks coming in the area. Vermont is hampered by its image when we go out to recruit, when we talk to site selectors who are looking at bringing companies in, when we go over the border to Quebec, or when we have Quebec economic development groups come down and sample Vermont. Um, as the former uh, Premier Couillard said, um, I love Vermont. I love to come here and shop. I love to boat and I love to ski. But I don't think of Vermont as a place to do economic development. And I think that um, sentiment, although it was very hard to hear, is a sentiment that we hear whether or not we're at a site selector conference in Chicago or Florida or Boulder. Vermont has an image of being a wonderful place of cows, of maple syrup, of leaves. Uh, and those things, <coughs> frankly, as those, those externalities, those soft traits, are one of the reasons we can sell Vermont as a place for people to come and do business. Once we convince them that we um, are not an economic backwater, that we have significant companies uh, that have chosen to locate here, that have chosen to grow here. Uh, we look at you know, the, the decision that um, uh, revision made uh, to grow in Vermont. They recently are growing outside of Vermont, not because of a Vermont reason, uh, and they're very clear about that. It's just to access an, an easier market. Um, revision, the commitment that uh, Global Foundries has made to the area, and we could talk about your opportunities as a community to, to work with Global Foundries around their property sale. Um, so we are a place where people are investing. And um, we have to get past the image. And frankly, working with the Vermont Department of Economic Development, the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing, I think we're beginning to change the image a little bit, or we're working to change the image. Um, 
we like cows and we like leaves and we like barns, but we also want people to know that we have high-speed fiber uh, in places in some of our larger hubs, whether it's Springfield or Burlington or Rutland, Bennington. Um, you can come and locate a tech company there. You can be, have a remote workforce there. Uh, we met with, uh, we had 65 people come to uh, the Stay to Stay program in Burlington about three, four weeks ago uh, or so. 65 people, a num all between 25 and I'd say 40 years old at the oldest. And many of those were working for companies like Microsoft where they could be anywhere. They were just tired of living in urban areas. We had healthcare professionals, young healthcare professionals from um, the Boston area looking to move to Vermont because of uh, the health uh, center that we have here. And those stories are repeated. Uh, there was something on VPR about what happened in Rutland, the same type of event happened, Bennington, Brattleboro. So in those areas where we have kind of the technology deployed, you know, we're beginning to see some uptake in the work that we're doing. Um, you know, I can't hide from the fact that the cost of doing business and the cost of living in Vermont is very high. And um, you, you'll hear it from manufacturing companies, whether it's Global or General Dynamics or Appalachian Flooring in the Kingdom or Tivoli or, M I mean, go around the state. If you have a higher electric user, you have a problem with electric rates in Vermont. And I don't have an answer for you. It is just something that um, we have to deal with time and time again when we address Quebec companies uh, who are looking at both Plattsburgh and Vermont. We try to explain to them that if they move into a new building because of our Vermont energy code, the buildings are incredibly energy efficient. They're actually going to use less at a higher rate. Some of you know this, um, this song, but that's really hard when they're looking at bottom line. They're looking at four to five cent a kilowatt hour differences. So that is a problem. Our tax structure um, is problematical. We don't have enough people making good incomes in Vermont to um, afford the services um, at an affordable rate that we want and expect. And I think we're working to create better paying jobs. Um, that's a problem. Cost of housing is an issue. The housing stock is an issue. Uh, we hear from uh, the young professionals that while they really like when they're truly young, condominiums and townhouses, at the point they no, want, no longer want to live um, like they did in college, they're looking for small houses. They're looking for, um, they want to be close to a downtown or a town center. They want a small house with a yard, and I, you know, if I can be colloquial, they want the white picket fence. They like what's being built. I think you know, the housing stock that is going up uh, is fine. We need more of it, but we also have to look at um, building the second and third iteration of houses if people want to stay in the area. And that's, that's not coming from some 64-year-old guy who remembers, you know, Levittown in New York um, or off Sand Hill in Essex where my house is. That's coming from young people saying, it's fine to live downtown above the pizza place, but I actually want a house when we have a family. It's kind of an interesting um, uh, data point. Um, other issues that get in the way, and we hear this, it's amazing when you have a round table with these young folks, the availability and cost of daycare is a huge issue. Um, uh, we've lost a lot of home care, uh, daycare home care services because of, it's very difficult for some of the kind of mom and pop, if you will, home care and daycare providers to meet the current regulations, although you know, we support training and education, et cetera, et cetera, it's beginning to push people out and, and make the market higher. Um, stories are rampant of people basically as soon as they are pregnant or know they're going to be pregnant, getting on a list. And I know of young people who will pay six months of childcare when they're, before their child goes in just to hold a spot. Um, that's not helpful when you're trying to recruit young families to the area. So the, those are one of the impediments I think that people don't think about. We always, we complain about taxes, we complain about permitting, and we complain, complain about all of that stuff. But when you get people really interested and they start asking about the cost of a house, uh, 
the availability of daycare those things those things get in the way so i've rambled now for probably fifteen minutes which is more than you wanted me to i think what can i answer for you i mean what questions do you have about what what else we do or i'm nothing if not full of opinions about stuff so i don't know answer any questions So here's just a, a bizarre question. I mean, I, as a business person, I've been part of the chamber off and on, so I yep. understand it. And I don't mean this in any other way than direct. What's in it for a municipality to be a member of the chamber? <laughs> um, a couple things. And uh, one is just having another voice besides the League of Cities and Towns and advocating for um, kind of pro-local government positions in, in Montpelier. Um, you know, last year we followed 64 pieces of legislation and we're probably active in 40 plus pieces of legislation. Um, so we work very closely with the other business associations, with the leagues of cities and towns to kind of push forward things that are, are helpful to communities, uh, with growth legislation, those types of things. Uh, we're working on the Act 250, the 50th anniversary review of Act 250. I mean, those are all things that benefit municipalities as, as they look to grow. The other thing is um, we've done this uh, for Colchester many years ago, probably 10 years ago. We did some work for Essex. If you're interested in working with the community to help you figure out where you're going strategically, when you talk about economic development, it really is a long play. It's, you're not going to fix anything in three or five years. It's a five, 10, and 15 year strategy of understanding who you are and who you want to be. Um, we can help with that. Um, if you have an interest in, in working with us, we'll work with you to help vision what's, what's in it for Williston, where you can go and grow. Uh, the other thing is simply supporting, we have 100 plus members um, who are Williston businesses. So, in a way, when the town joins, like Essex and South Burlington and Burlington, and all the town, you're supporting in a, indirectly the members who also are, are members of the chamber. Uh, and job one in economic development is to show support to the businesses that are here, understand what their needs are, and help them grow. And helping you understand the needs of your 100 plus members who are, are our or businesses that are our members is a way that you can begin to formulate town policies that actually support them without inadvertently doing things that might make it harder for them to be successful, uh, create more jobs and pay higher wages. Uh, it's, is it a direct ROI? Can I say we can create X number of jobs and bring this much capital investment into your town? No, but we can support, as I said, development activities and municipal policies that help that happen. Thanks. Can, I get, can I get you a glass of water? Yeah, you know, I made a big mistake of having two slices of very good Ramontos pizza. Um, <laughs> two things happened. My mouth got very dry and my pants got full of grease as I drove <laughs> down. Uh, so I wish we had a, a curtain on the table, but thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Tom? No? Oh, well, oh. I'll take my water. <laughs> so I guess I have a couple. Um, the, the first one I'm going to ask is, you mentioned a lot of business. Mm -hmm. Does that also extend to the retail side of what might be um, considered commercial uh, or commerce? In supporting those businesses? Yes. Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. Okay, I just uh, yeah. wasn't sure there. <clears throat> um, the vast majority of our members, over 85%, have fewer than 25 employees. Their restaurants. Their sole proprietorships, their small construction companies, their retail companies, a lot of tourism companies. Um, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm first going to talk about uh, a concern. I've not a concern, is a bad word, but an issue I've had for years. And then I'd like to hear more about how you, how your organization and the town can work together on some town planning type mm -hmm. things. And. Um, I don't know how well you know Williston, but we have limits on residential growth. Mm -hmm. 
we do not have limits on non-residential growth. And I've often wondered, is, is that a good thing or not? Stated a little bit differently, I've wondered what is the right amount of non-residential growth for a community like Williston? And I realize there's no silver bullet type answer to that. On the other hand, I think we could maybe use, the, the word isn't necessarily help, but maybe guidance in the sense of, you know, what are some of the indicators that say, maybe we're getting it right? What are some of the indicators that might be saying, nope, you're off the mark? Um, to give you a for instance, um, some people think that Williston is a little bit too, hop he too heavy, if you will, on large national type Mm -hmm. retail organizations and less so on the more local, smaller um, uh, type stores or restaurants. Mm -hmm. And so that might be a, the type of indicator I'm talking about. So first of all, does any of that make sense? Yeah, uh, and, I, and I think your path to answer that is um, through your community members. I don't, I don't think there's a metric that says you have too much of one or too little of another. I think that's defined by, by your community and what you want through the town. I mean, as some of you know, I mean, I, I spent six years on the Essex Planning Commission, six years on the select board, and was there when we were, you know, in 90, when we were starting to look at the town plan and where we wanted to grow and how much growth was, was right and where we wanted it. And that's, the 12 years I was involved, I mean, that's an evolutionary process and it gets clearer and clearer as you go on. It's not the best answer I can give you. But, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Paul Costello and the Vermont Council for Rural Development. Uh, I sit on the state downtown board and we give out tax credits, all that stuff. Anyway, um, community after community has come in uh, and talked about kind of the aha moment that their community has had, large and small, after going through the process with the Vermont Council on Rural Development, understanding what it really is that their community wanted, where they wanted growth, the types of growth uh, that they wanted. So that answer, I think, is baked into the neighborhoods in your community and, and your people here. One of the difficulties with Williston is that Williston, our residents, is one size, mm -hmm. but the amount of people who come through Williston and frequent a lot of our, you know, establishments mm -hmm. is a lot bigger oh. and not from Williston. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Ramonto said right, the yeah, pizza yeah. on your lap is a good example. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's the same in Essex, right, in terms of, you know, we have a lot of people coming in, especially when the outlets were more robust and they're going through an evolution now. Um, I mean, Colchester has gone through the same thing because of Mallets Bay and the number of people who go there. Um, I mean, that's all good. They, people like me leave money in, in lots of different towns. Um, but there is that balance point that uh, the money is nice, but how much, or how much traffic will people accept? What kind of traffic? Um, the un I understand the, the limits on residential growth. It, it seems odd that you have limits on one and not the other, but that gets into the whole question of how many school rooms do you need, how many teachers, how many buses. Oh, yeah. and, and, I mean, you know that. So. And it was the schools. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have done that work um, with communities before, just as a partner, um, basically in, in groups giving information and we're happy to do that. You usually get me when you sign on for that, so depending on your, your tolerance for me, it's either good or bad. Uh, That's good, thank you. Tom, how much are you involved with um, Miro in Burlington and the new potential program that's out there to try to make shoppers feel safer? And it was just on the news this morning, so oh, it's yeah. just a, a new, you may not be at all yet. Um, <clears throat> and then I have a follow-up question, kind of sort of related, but not really. So um, we're involved with Burlington on a number of uh, on a number of issues, uh, BTV Ignite and using uh, the fiber to kind of spur economic development. We were uh, advocates for the, the town center uh, going forward and did some lobbying around that. Uh, serve on the land use policy committee in Burlington and a number of other kind of larger macro issues. Um, when it gets to things like 
parking and trees in the park, we leave that stuff to the BBA because they, the Burlington Business Association, they do a phenomenal job on like really local issues. Um, so, and we, they're members of ours, we're members of theirs. So it's a divide and conquer. We, we do what we do, they do what they do. And so I'm not familiar with, the, so with that I particular I think the reason issue. I was asking that is that one of the problems that I see with, with you mentioned it with Vermont in general, is it's very expensive to live here. Mm -hmm. And that's because we are so heavily social service. So, so much of our money is going towards social services. Yep. Not enough people paying into the tax base yep. anymore. And Burlington's biggest problem that I see and why I don't go there anymore, so it's not getting a lot of my money and a lot of my time, is because the homeless population is, in my eyes, out of control. It's an uncomfortable place to be. And that's a sad statement to make. That's just my statement, but that's a sad statement to make. And there are, there are I won't, can't speak for a lot of people, there are a number of us that are uncomfortable going down there in the evening now because you just don't know. So my question is, if you're trying to, mm -hmm. if, going back to the economic thing, how, I, my, my push would not be obviously towards more taxes and more expenses and more whatever. Right. I don't know that, that getting a program out there that's going to walk someone down the street and make them feel safer shopping is a good use of money and time or taxpayer dollars versus what is the chamber's position towards the state mm -hmm. in terms of, yep. let's get these, did I, I didn't phrase oh, it well, no, but thankfully that, you're following me. I got you. Um, okay, so, so in my, my other life, I'm, I'm chair of the board of COTS. Um, I've been involved with COTS for about nine years or so. And um, uh, that goes back to my earlier background in the state of Vermont. I, you know, I began my career in human services, working in, in, uh, with uh, delinquents and abused and neglected kids and all of that. The perfect background for Oh, yeah. This um, so nothing phases me anymore. Um, so let me take a step back. Um, and state the obvious. We have a huge problem in Vermont. We have a huge mental health problem in Vermont. When we closed the state hospital, um, we did not have and do not have an adequate safety net for folks who with mental illness. And the safety problem is you can be homeless without being a threat to people. The threat to people, and we see this in the shelters that we run at COTS, we are dealing with mental health crisis after mental health crisis after mental health crisis. People with machetes, people taking fluorescent light bulbs out and, and going after people. The, the, the acuity, the severity of the population that we are dealing with um, is beyond anything that anyone has seen, compounded with, again, what we all know, the drug problem in town. So what we have been saying from the chamber in, in a coalition of folks um, through the Opioid Council and working with the Agency of Human Services, the state has to step up and do something around system of care for, for mental illness. Um, you know, we have a fairly good health network in the state of Vermont, uh, whether you're at Grace Cottage Hospital in Townsend or, or Burlington. We have a horrible system for treating um, the mentally ill in, in, in this community, uh, in, in this state. Uh, I'm not for deinstitutionalization. My first job in Vermont was to deinstitutionalize Week School. Um, so I, I'm a believer <coughs> that community mental health services and community services were necessary. But there is a population that is on the street that um, res they deserve better than being left on the street. Frankly, we're not serving them in a way that I think Vermont should serve its most troubled and disadvantaged. And I, I get, you know, really, I get a little bit upset with that, having been involved uh, in this world for close to 40 years. So. That makes more sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, I'll give you an example. It was Back, a very complicated question. Oh, so. yeah. I mean, it struck it, it me. I, I tell the story all the time, you know, back before I, uh, I had my little health issue when I was about 250 plus pounds. I was a big guy. I was literally walking down Church Street in Burlington. I got a hot dog and I was eating it and was accosted by a homeless person who wanted a bite of my hot dog. And I just laughed. I mean, it's like, but that was me. I was a big guy. Um, but if I was not my size, 
or if I was, frankly, a woman or a young person walking down who was accosted by someone as wild-eyed as this person wanting a bite of my hot dog, I, I'd be nervous, and that's not good for business. Um, shootings on uh, Main Street, not good for business. The theater of the street, the mama drama that goes on because of the density of folks who come down, the police will tell you it's, it's, it's not good for business. Um, I'm not saying that's a lot of where my focus was, was how to clean that up that makes Burlington more of a place that you want to go, and then all of that ends up going out to the other communities as well. And, the, and I think that is a problem that actually has to be addressed at, at the state level, at the, the policy level in Montpelier, um, at, at the legislative level, at the executive level. Um, Someone just basically needs to say, enough is enough. We're going to take care of these people who need taken care of. But in the meantime, if they don't, which Montpelier is famous for kicking the can down the road, True. you have an unbelievable uphill battle that you're trying to do, and that was no offense to you. No, no, I mean, no. no, no so true. you end up with an, with an unbelievable battle that you're constantly mm -hmm. trying to fight to create a bigger, brighter, wonderful Vermont. And meanwhile, you've got other states shipping they're homeless and they're sick here because the services are so good and we don't have the support system to be able to help all these people. And we are trying, you know, it's with bubble gum and, and you know, bailing twine, trying to hold it together. And I, I, and I see that from the human services side. You know, the uh, community health center opening up the, uh, the wet shelter um, to try to get those folks off the street, especially on nights when it's really, really cold. Um, we've kind of expanded our services and our level of tolerance um, around behaviors just so we don't have people on the street. Um, as some of you may know, we had some significant funding cuts from the federal government, state government, and local funding that put in jeopardy um, the day station, which is where people go during the day, uh, especially in the winter. If we're not open, they're on the street. And so we were able to, through COTS, you know, do some fundraising to keep the, the day station open. But, you know, what we were saying to the, the city and others, if we're not there, you got them. So let's figure this out together. And, and in fairness, um, the city's doing a pretty good job. I mean, despite the odds and, and the uphill battle, um, there, you may not always agree with how they address the problem, but at least the problems are, are being addressed. And the mayor is um, basically open about, here are our problems, this is what we're trying to do to fix them. You never get it 100% right, but God, I, I, give, I give him a lot of credit for at least trying. You gotta try something, as opposed to paralysis. Thank you for all that you do, both on the in the chamber. I mean, you do a ton. Yes. <laughs> Anything else for Tom? Thank you so much. We appreciate you. You're coming. welcome. Thank you for the time. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, I didn't forget to leave. Moving on to the hurricane lane discontinuance. Eric, I think that's your topic yep. for tonight. <clears throat> so the last meeting, the board directed staff to pursue the discontinuance process for a <laughs> segment of hurricane lane, a, a hammerhead, and it's part of this movement to create more parking spaces for potential business to come into town. It would move, essentially move the buffer zone and create another 12 parking spaces here. And the town would in turn receive um, an unrestricted easement back onto the property. So <coughs> as you'll remember recently with Chapman Lane, we've got to have a site visit and a public <coughs> hearing. So um, question before the board tonight, there's a resolution with a notice of inspection and hearing in your packet. Um, if the board supports this, looking for um, a motion to support these pieces here, and we'll follow up with posting this accordingly and mailing out certified letters to uh, adjacent landowners. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, so we saw the Chapman Lane project, maybe even a little bit more straightforward than that. Everybody wants this at this point. Uh, would you entertain a motion? I would. Move to adopt the resolution on discontinuance and notice of inspection and hearing for a segment of Hurricane Lane as presented. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Just a real quick question. It sounds like we have enough for a quorum. Um, yes, we do. I, I, 
highly unlikely I'll be able to make it. Sorry. Yep, and thanks, everyone, for your communications last week. We found we can have four um, select board members. Great. That. Great. And I will do my – it's okay for me to do my own. <clears throat> no, you're not What's that? To it. You're not with us. <laughs> you That's right. You're with it's like us. It's a jury. <laughs> it's like a jury. You can't deliberate on your own. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving on to errors and omissions. And Rick, I presume you're taking the lead on this one? No, actually, I'm not. Pretty. Oh, okay. This is pretty straightforward also. Yep, there was just, uh, I spoke to the assessor's office, and there was just a couple clerical oversights when the boards were present, was presented the first errors and omissions um, a couple weeks ago. So these are two adjustments that should have been on the original errors and omissions. Overall, it would have an impact of um, negative $149 um, in tax revenue. Uh, recommendation by the listers is to uh, approve these and make an amendment to the errors and omissions for uh, county. Any questions on this for Eric? Motion again is in order. I move to approve the addendum to the corrections of the 2018 grand list as proposed by the listers. Second. <clears throat> Is there a discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> so we've carried that. And moving on to traffic calming policy. Eric, I presume you're doing this one too. Yep. It's my segment of the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I did for this newest, our latest draft. Um, Teresa had sent me some um, written comments, and there was discussion previous meeting as well. So I worked to incorporate that into this document. And I can, I can highlight the substantive changes if you'd like and kind of walk through. Yeah, sure. just if you would, please. <clears throat> we'll start in section uh, 5.5. I've softened the language from determining a response strategy for which I want interest group coalition of stakeholders to developing a response strategy. Then I've added language at the end. In circumstances where a formal study is recommended, the select board will grant approval to pursue the study. <coughs> Section 6.2 under a level one response, I've added just language that the party that raised the issue will be informed of the process that will be followed to just add further clarity to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on, section 7.2, I've added language in here to talk about informing the neighborhood of proposed temporary evaluative treatments. When we we're talking about traffic calming, these ideas were. We're going to try out maybe a speed hump in the neighborhood, putting a temporary one in there for a little while to see, see how it works, see how people react to it. And also just language that the SLEP board will be kept updated of any temporary physical enhancements um, before implementation and the funds to cover permanent enhancements should be available in the budget. Or sorry, the cost of these temporary enhancements, we should have money before we put those out there and purchase them. Uh, section 8.2. Language added here that the select board would provide authorization to initiate the formal traffic calming study. Um, these are level three responses we've, we've looked at. Eric, do you mind if uh, un under that one you just talked about in 8.2, but also going back to, oh, where was it before, 5.5, where um, the select board is being needs to give approval for studies, before, I guess, before they can occur. And I'm a little bit sitting on the fence on this. I understand um, Terry's point about she thinks the select board should have more involvement, and that's I think that, that was put in, in response to that. On the other hand, it's I kind of trust staff to know what to do. Um, that's, you know, why we have good staff. Um, and... I, I guess there's a corresponding other side of that, and I'm trying to figure out what <clears throat> makes the most sense here. Is that kind of becoming a bit onerous to have to come to the select board and get these approvals or authorizations? I guess maybe that's the simplest way to ask I it. I completely agree with you on that statement. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> just. Yeah, I would just, just respond as, as a board how, how you feel the policy is appropriate, what kind of step you would like to take. I, I think we would include in the budget funds for these, so if maybe if the budget was going to be overspent, <coughs> updating the board, how, however the board wants, feels it's best to approach. 
I, I, and, and isn't that consistent with how we do other studies where, and, and like when we go through our budget process, we have maybe line items for studies that the public works department or the fire or whoever might initiate, but in terms of actually choosing when do we need a study and whether the study ought to be authorized doesn't come to the select board, does it, typically? They generally do the, they do not come to the select board for that kind of thing. I, I guess I'm not seeing a reason either why we should okay. be, yeah. I agree. I agree. Is this? And I, sorry, Eric, because we kind of have flip-flopped a little bit here on, oh, on you. That's fine. So I put all the feedback here on the document and, and yeah. the floor can decide the policy direction. To the Wilson select board. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing to keep in mind here is we're talking about a policy and and it's a, a document that I s strongly suspect will go through many changes once we start to actually yes. get experience with get it. Get experience with it. That, that's a good way of putting it. Because um, it, it's, it's our first try at it at yeah. this point, and I fully expect that there are going to be some changes once we get into it. And, and if we feel like um, there's a piece of this where the select board is being left out, then we're going to need to plug that or make that change because that is not the intent here. Um, but. And I don't view it as the you know in intent at all. I mean, and, and ultimately, when the critical decisions come, which is probably mostly during budget season, we do have that voice. Um, we are expected to chime in. So um, I've, I've heard a problem, perhaps with that sentence, and perhaps the if we have concurrence to strike that. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about section. In, on, five, on page five sentence. at the top. Yeah, five, 5.5. 5. 5. 5. 5. 8.2. Yes, I think we. <clears throat> so if we, let's take them one at a time. I think we were agreement on 5.5 5 on page five at the top of the five to strike that sentence. <clears throat> then moving over to 8.2, <clears throat> there's a new sentence added there as well that uh, talks about providing authorization. Is there Concurrence to strike that as well. Yes. Okay. And, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to spat off a little bit. I mean, this would be the type thing where in the manager's report we hear about um, that there was a study, you know, has been initiated. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the type thing with that, you know, that would be the appropriate communication. Okay, I am proceeding on for the rest of the... Uh... Um, and I think this will be a, another change along those lines of the draft language here in Appendix B. Um, we have a, I've changed a step one for a select board approval for the... This gets into the formalized steps in the process for a traffic calming study. So I've, I've inserted step, step one select board approval. Um, that, that may be something the board wants to discuss further based on those other two edits. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to take that out. The, the, the second sentence is, is fine. Um, right. It's an accurate statement. And one we would yeah. agree with. So you're thinking of re removing the first sentence in the step one? Yes. <clears throat> yes. If there is there a concurrence on doing that? Yes. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would ask, um, want me to rename step one to um, funding available to funds of that nature? Uh, sure, for a different title. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, Rename to funding available from select, select board approval, the, the title of step one. Okay, yeah. Oh, and then step four. Under that, I've added two additional details. So there's, under the third bullet point, talking about possible traffic calming measures identified should be recommended treatments for the roadway segment under examination as identified by Federal Highway Administration, agency transportation, inclusive of industry best practices, and also including possible impacts for bicycles, pedestrians, other roadway users, and any ancillary impacts, for example, noise created by a, a traffic calming treatment. Yeah, good. Yep. 
Well That's done. it. So if there's no other comments or <coughs> questions on this, a motion would be in order to uh, approve this with the uh, recommended, recommended, recommended uh, striking of sentences. So moved. Second. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on the motion? Great, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Moving on to the budget review, and that's Rick. With your permission, I'd like to go to manager's report first. To give <clears throat> Eric a, t a couple minutes to set up. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good. Big, Fine. Um, projector. Sure. I have a, a short PowerPoint I wanted to show. Excuse me. Sure. Let's come on. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, this isn't a very long manager report, so <clears throat> Eric, you'll have to make it fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, first off, I, I wanted to remind board members that our next meeting is a week from tonight, December 11th. Um, and there are two noteworthy things, or three maybe noteworthy things. First of all, the meeting starts at 6 p.m. Second of all, the meeting will not be held here. It'll be held in Williston Woods Community Room. And thirdly, uh, the entire focus of that meeting is just budget. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're going to start at 6 and <coughs> we, uh, try to get you out there by 9 or so. So we're not running too late. Uh, the idea on uh, the early start is to allow um, a little bit more time to get through more budgets. So by the end of this month, the board will have reviewed all operating, general fund operating budgets. Eleventh at six. No. Yes. Yes. All right. You got the plug in here. Yeah, All right. The uh, second thing I wanted to mention. Let's see. Is um, the uh, recruitment process for um, uh, finance director? Uh, as of uh, the date I wrote this, I had twenty applications. I now have thirty-three. <laughs> still coming in um, and uh, my hope is to involve one select board member in the interview process my thinking is that um, I'm gonna have a two-step process one is the first round of interviews where I will do maybe six seven interviews that's an all-day process uh, my thinking is that I would um, ask uh, a, for a volunteer for the board to participate in the second round of interviews, which will be a much shorter process. We'll probably have two to three applicants, and that process could take um, two to three hours, depending on how many applicants we have. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll Well, that I, won't work for you. Anytime I can avoid anything to do with math and numbers, <laughs> even, even interviewing Fair somebody enough. who might enjoy those things. Okay, thank you for that. Um, who, him or me? <laughs> another thing I wanted to touch on is um, our, I think I mentioned recently, we were struggling with our public works department. Mm -hmm. And um, we're still struggling, but the good news is we are fully staffed. Uh, the bad news is that we're a uh, good part of our staff is inexperienced in plowing. Um, so we, we are running with uh, a training session at the same time. We, you know, we've had these early storms, so they've served as training sessions. <coughs> and we've been able to bring in, um, well, in some cases, uh, Bruce has ridden with one of the drivers, and uh, we had, we've been trying to bring in some of our retired workers to kind of ride with some of the drivers. Um, we've had mixed results of that. But uh, we've managed okay. I, I, haven't, I haven't received really any complaints. Um, I know at least in one case, one of our experienced drivers knocked over a few more mailboxes than might normally be the case. But uh, I think that's what that should be expected. So um, they're doing their best to uh, provide. I have to imagine that heavy snow <sighs> was difficult to to move. Um, well, these are pretty big, heavy trucks. Uh, 
I sure did a good job moving it on my driveway. I was going to say, they didn't, you did a great job with that wall at the end of my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I had the same wall. <laughs> and it was heavy. Yeah. Yes, it was. So, um, and then the final thing, it, it's not in my written report, it's, um, uh, it's an update on the Catamount Outdoor Family Center. Well, not, I'm sorry, it's the Catamount property. Uh, the closing uh, we had anticipated was going to be the end of December. It now looks like it will not be the end of December. It looks like they're going to the end of January. Um, th th I, I guess there was some sort of issue involving the um, appraisal. It wasn't the value. It was the, um, the, the federal <coughs> appraisal has to meet very strict standards, and, and the first one that was done did not. And okay. So they had to redo it. And um, I, so that came in fairly recently, and there's some other issues that need to be followed through on. So uh, right now, it, we're looking at the end of January. And I'll update you if there's anything more that comes across my desk um, on that matter. Would you happen to know how the fundraising, that last little bit? Well, it, the, <coughs> uh, my expectation is, uh, um, well, my hope is that we will end up with the full amount by the end of January. My expectation is that we're gonna be short. But that will not jeopardize the project. It may okay. mean that we'll have um, less money for some things, uh, like we were hoping to set up uh, like a fund for future improvements that may be underfunded. Um, and there are some other things that uh, may change. Okay. Um, so that's, okay. that's where we're at on that at this point. And so I think we're that's it for manager report, unless you had anything more on that. So let's. Let's do the budget for you. Yeah, hey, it worked. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking uh, Jennifer Canelli, our finance director, um, who helped put this together and continues to work uh, for us on a part time basis. Uh, in helping to get us through this interim period while we're looking for her replacement. Um, so, Jennifer, thank you. And I also want to thank, of course, all of the various department heads um, for all the hard work that they put in, uh, in, in putting this budget together. It, it starts in September and uh, ends, well, it ends in March. <laughs> right, true. <laughs> uh, and w one thing I always want to emphasize uh, Looking at a budget, it looks like a bunch of numbers, and it is, but it's really a plan for services because that it's really about the services that we provide this community, and we provide a wide range of services. Those services are actually identified in your budget book. If um, I think associated with each letter of transmittal for each department is a list of services. I encourage you to look at that list because you may find some surprising services in there that we provide. Um, you know, obviously we, we, we um, provide the basics of uh, plowing the streets and uh, offering police protection services and fire and ambulance. Uh, and we have a library and uh, we, uh, through our town clerk's office, we run elections, which is an important part of our democracy. Uh, the uh, property records are kept by that office, um, wide range of recreation activities and programs and, and facilities. So th there's much that we offer. It's all part of the services we provide and it's all enabled through this budget document. So we have to, it's important to keep that in mind as we move forward. So um, just a quick overview before I get into some details. The uh, budget that's being proposed for next fiscal year is $11,482,345. This represents an increase of $371,310, which overall is a 3.3% increase over the current budget. Uh, the operating portion of that budget, though, is, represents about a 5% increase. Overall, it's 3.3 because uh, some of the other items are going down. And one of the reasons why the costs are going up beyond the obvious is our population's going up. 
it's interesting how steady the increase has been. It's about 100 people per year, year in and year out. And um, at least over the 20 years I've been here, uh, it's been 100 people a year. And gradually we've been moving up the um, list of top communities in the state. Uh, when I, many years ago, we were at 14. Uh, now we're at 10 and we're closing in on number nine. Um, I was surprised at that. I, uh, this, the um, town of Hartford is next in line and their population went down a little bit and we went up a little bit and so we're, the gap is down. <coughs> so um, I found that a little surprising. So uh, with increased population comes an increased demand for services. Um, so that, that's part of what's driving um, the uh, increase in budget. And you'll see in the budget, there's a couple positions that are being proposed to be added. Uh, and that's partly because of the demand for service. Um, the other part, of course, is the cost of living is increasing and it has picked up. It was just a few years ago, we were looking at a zero increase in the cost of living and now it's That's a factor too, because every piece of what we do is affected by that. Um, the, the services we purchase, the supplies we purchase, and the um, pay that we need to pay our employees in a very competitive labor market is all part of that. So to um, <coughs> uh, identify um, so I wanted to talk about some of the major uh, cost factors that are driving the increase <clears throat> beyond the general things. Oh, okay. <laughs> beyond the general items that uh, I just mentioned, uh, the, the largest single category of line items is the wages and benefits. I, I put the two together, and that represents a, about a 330, almost $336,000 increase. And there's a number of factors here, so uh, I'll cover a couple quick ones. Uh, and a lot of these are summarized in my letter of transmittal, which is included in your budget book. Uh, first, um, the good news is we had a decrease in our health insurance costs. We, we talked about that fairly recently. Uh, that's kind of counter to the trends, um, and uh, we don't expect that we'll be able to duplicate that, but um, that is something that uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, worked through for the uh, next fiscal year. Um, as I also said, wages are increasing. So in this budget is included a cost of living increase for employees, uh, uh, com again, to try to maintain our competitiveness in the uh, tight labor market. Uh, our police department is seeing a little bit bigger increase in wages than normal, not because we've added any persons, but because we've um, anticipate that we will be fully staffed next fiscal year. And we haven't been fully staffed in a number of years. In fact, we've been down two to three people um, for good parts, portions of the year. Right now, we are down just one position, um, and I have every confidence in the, our current chief in filling that. Uh, it, it, one interesting little side note, uh, our chief, um, because he, um, was coming in from out of state, was required to undertake a fair amount of training down at the police academy. Um, and he groused about that a lot, um, partly because he probably could have taught a lot of the courses <laughs> that they were offering. But the academy was very insistent that he take these courses and meant a lot of time away from the office, but he did it. Well, it also gave him an opportunity to meet a lot of the um, recruits. <laughs> and so he's made a lot of good contacts through that process. And so our hope is that uh, he may be able to encourage a, a couple of the recruits that were going through the academy, not necessarily away from other communities, but if they're interested in moving, then obviously um, they've met our chief and they know what a great chief he is. So we're hoping that uh, that will help in his recruitment process. But in any case, all that adds up to um, uh, needing money to f 
pay for those positions. And for the last several years, we've actually budgeted a little bit less in the department, even though we didn't cut positions because we knew we weren't going to fill them. Well, now we do um, anticipate filling them, so we've budgeted for the, the full staffing. So that does result in an increase in that budget. Um, another position, uh, <coughs> we're actually adding a couple positions, but one, the first position we're adding, it's kind of, well, it, the, it's a position that, I don't know how to, where to start on this one. <laughs> it's, it, it's a position that um, worked both, um, let's say 60% of the time roughly in our parks department and 40% in our highway department. So in other words, during the summer, spring, summer, and early fall, they would do a lot of the park maintenance, a lot of lawn mowing. And in the winter months, they would drive a plow truck. And that worked well for years. Um, as it happens though, 100% of that money was budgeted in the highway department and none was budgeted in parks. And our needs have been growing in both areas and actually also been growing in our um, uh, buildings and grounds area. So what we're proposing to do is take that position and make it full time in parks, 100%. And of course, it's looking like we're adding one whole new position there when we're really only adding 40% of that position. And, um, but that allow us to um, do the 60% we've always been doing, plus there's some additional work that they can be doing during that other 40% that they used to be doing in public works, and that some of that can be also building some grounds. So that's how we're filling that out. The other piece is, all right, so we had the 40% work that was being done in, by this position. We're making that 100% public works. So they're gaining 60%. I don't know if that all makes sense to you. But <laughs> anyway, it's really one new position and uh, we're dividing it up um, a little bit differently. And so the, the, uh, it, there's an increase in cost because of that. And there, there's also gonna be a shifting in, in costs as well since the parks person was never fully really attributable to parks. It was wholly attributable to highway. So the highway will look good because they won't change at all. But <laughs> all right, so um, another position we're adding is the, um, we're splitting the town clerk and treasurer's position. So right now, the, uh, we have one person doing that, that's Deb Beckett. She does one part-time, the other part-time, making one full-time job. So by splitting it, you'll have one full-time town clerk and one full-time treasurer. And this will, it, it, this is consistent with the charter change that's being proposed. If the charter isn't changed, that may affect how this is structured. Um, but the extra um, manpower in both offices is needed. So eventually some sort of change will have to be funded, I think. But anyway, that's, that's that position. Um, on open space, there's a big change. We're seeing a decrease of 185,000, um, but that's partly because last, the, the current fiscal year, we had um, a one-time expense of 200,000 that we put into the Environment Reserve Fund for the Catamount property purchase. That goes away and the difference is we put a little bit more money in affordable housing and a little bit more money into the Environmental Reserve Fund. So that's where that came up with. Um, on capital projects and debt service, we're seeing an increase of about 121,000. Um, and that's, uh, I won't go into detail on that, but that's explained in our capital budget. So this is for those who like the graphic look of things. This is our uh, pie chart. Um, and um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but um, I, I would say that uh, about 55% of our expenditures goes directly towards supporting public safety related functions. Uh, and that includes the highway department, the police department, and the fire departments. 
That 55% um, might even be higher if you took the debt service that was and, and the capital that was directly attributed to blows. Um, I didn't bother to do that, but suffice it to say that uh, a huge part of what we do in terms of services is public safety related. So let's talk a little bit about revenue. Uh, this is mostly good news. Uh, we're expecting uh, an increase in interest rates uh, and uh, with an increase in interest rates is an increase in revenue. Um, I remember for many years it was going the other way and every year we were budgeting too much for interest and we had to keep going lower and lower until we reached a plateau and it was almost nothing and now it's starting to creep back up. And so, um, it's being reflected here as an uh, additional revenue of $84,000. <laughs> Another uh, line item where we uh, have budgeted an increase is local option tax. Uh, um, I know I've said this many, many times, this is a extremely volatile revenue source. And right now we're continuing to see increases. Um, part of that is in the rooms and meals. Um, and there's uh, a new restaurant opening up in the near future, or um, Maple Tree Place, um, and the, the retail businesses seem to be doing well. Um, I, I, I suspect part of some of the additional revenue coming in is relating to um, more companies paying taxes on sales over the internet. Um, that is having an impact. We have no way of finding out how much of an impact because the state won't tell us. They keep that confidential. Um, but it, I'm sure that's part of what's going on. But clearly, when there is going, uh, when there is going to be a downturn in the economy, we will see significant decreases in this revenue, and the fund balance will help us out in that point when we get to that point. Um, but in any case, right now we're um, not anticipating a downturn for next fiscal year. But fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, so we, we are showing $85,000 increase. Um, on the highway revenue, I should have shown that as a negative number. Uh, we're showing a decrease in highway revenue, and that is strictly because we are um, doing less stormwater work, and we are keeping track of the work we do in stormwater, and because we're doing less, we can bill stormwater less. We can't. So it's a direct relationship. Um, and so that shows up as a, a negative um, $54,000 roughly. Um, fund balance uh, is an, another item. Oh, actually, I'll skip over that for the moment. <coughs> Planning and zoning fees would be the next one. Um, we, we're still seeing a fair amount of development. Uh, again, with downturn in economy um, and as we build out um, in future years, we'll likely see less. But um, I think for next year, we're still going to be seeing a fairly high level of um, fees coming in for various types of development. So we budgeted 30000 more um, than we, what we currently have in the budget. And finally, fund balance. Uh, we, um, uh, I believe this year, we've proposed to use $889,000, almost $890,000 of fund balance. We do expect some of that will get used. Perhaps not all of it, but some of it. So we will see our grant, uh, fund balance go down somewhat. Um, we're also proposing to uh, use uh, about 900000 next fiscal year as well. Um, some of that's in one-time expenses. Uh, some of it <coughs> is increasing the amount to directly reduce taxes. Um, I think there's a $100,000 increase in that as well. In fact, I think the next slide addresses that issue. This is a, a kind of a, a summary of our fund balance. We're currently, um, as of the end of June, uh, about $3.7 million, uh, which is above the range. Uh, the range that is set by select board policy is $1.1 million to $2.3 uh, If we use 100% uh, of what we anticipate using for the current fiscal year, that would bring us down to $2.8 million. And if we use 100% of the 900,000 that we're proposing for next fiscal year, that would bring us down to 1.9 million, which is within that range. 
my expectation is that we probably will not use 100%, um, but our expectation is that the range, we will be getting closer and closer to that range. And personally, I, I, I feel much more comfortable around the higher side of that range than the lower side, especially when a uh, <coughs> recession hits because um, we can easily lose two to $300,000 in revenue just like that from the local option tax without even knowing that that's gonna happen, uh, you know, that's this far ahead of time. So um, that's where we are on the fund balance. Again, with the pie chart here on the revenue side, uh, the not surprisingly uh, property tax is the largest single piece at 49%. Uh, the local option tax is a huge part of our budget uh, at 26%. And then we have a host of other um, Revenue sources, including user fees and host town funds. Um, this is, uh, I, I've said this past, but this is a, a, a pretty healthy um, distribution of revenues. In other words, we're not over reliant on any one source. Um, I, my, I guess I'd feel a little bit better for less, a little bit less reliant on local option tax because of its volatility. On the other hand, it's nice to not have to be as reliant on the property tax for our revenues. So. That's the trade-off that we have. And this is kind of relevant to the question, Jeff, you were asking of, uh, uh, earlier about the um, distribution of commerce or uh, business versus residential. Uh, this is our grand list breakdown by category. This is a couple years old, I think, but really it doesn't change much from year to year. Um, the, the biggest part um, of this pie is, of course, residential uh, at 57% and commercial is 27%. Uh, I would say that, um, that I, I like, as a manager, I like to see a kind of a nice distribution. Uh, I don't, again, I, I think communities that rely too much on residential or too much on commercial um, uh, create problems. But, we have a nice distribution here, and it's consistent with our town plan that we've developed over the years. <coughs> and, uh, it's, it, I think if there had been dissatisfaction with this kind of distribution, we would have seen dissatisfaction when we were looking at our town plan updates. And you know, generally what we do is tinker with it rather than having a wholesale revision. So uh, I think this, this distribution has worked well for the community. So uh, bottom line is how does this relate to taxes? Um, and of course, it's a, a simple matter of doing the math when you take the total expenditures, take all the revenues other than property taxes, and what you're left is what you have to raise in property taxes. And so our projection is uh, about 5.4 4 million. And uh, it, I, I've given two different numbers here using two different uh, grand list range, uh, numbers. So it's a, there's a bit of a range. The, uh, uh, first number is the uh, using a, a grand list of 199,670. That is our projected grand list. Uh, we're assuming some growth, and that would yield a tax rate of 27.24, 27 cents, roughly. Um, and uh, if we use the current grand list, which really we know there's going to be some growth, so. It, um, that would be about 27 and a half cents uh, tax rate. Um, that's per, uh, well, so our current rate, by the way, is 26.65. So that's the basis of comparison there. And so what does that mean for the taxpayer? It means that currently um, they're paying, uh, well, as I said, 26.65 or uh, 26 cents, a little over 26 and a half cents. Uh, so if we go with the lower number, uh, that means that instead of paying $266.50 per $100,000 in value in municipal taxes, they'd go up to $275 or $8.60 per $100,000 in value. And if we use the higher rate, uh, then it would be only five hundred, oh, sorry, five dollars and ninety cents um, increase in property taxes, <coughs> property taxes per hundred thousand dollar in value. And our 
over the last several years, I, I didn't do a slide on this, but our property tax rate has been actually changed very little. We, at <coughs> two years in a row, we're at 65 cents. And then we went to, uh, I'm sorry, not 65, uh, 26 cents. And then we went to um, you know, a little bit over that um, last year. So, um, and then the final slide is, uh, again, this is a little bit old, but um, I wasn't able to get there. the most recent data on this just yet, but Wilson traditionally has been at the very low end of the um, scale in terms of municipal property tax rates in Chittenden County. Uh, we've been always near the bottom, and I expect that when I do update this, we'll continue to be in that position. And so, um, this is the beginning <laughs> of uh, the process of the meeting next week. And uh, as I've said, uh, uh, we're starting at 6 p.m. And before I ask for any questions, I get, since Jennifer is here, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to, if there's anything you want to add to this overview. No. Okay. <laughs> so, any questions on the overview? Uh, ample opportunity in the next few weeks to do that, too. Yes, more than enough. We are going to, um, uh, the uh, budget will be posted in its entirety on our town webpage. We do not have it up there yet. I think the capital budget might up be up, but we're I'm re we're working to restructure how it looks so it'll be a little more appealing and maybe more people will look at it. Uh, we're also working on a video or two. Um, that we're trying to set up, set up a, a series of videos. I don't know how many we'll be able to get done this year, but each video will be short and it'll cover different aspects of the whole budget process. I know the first one we're working on has to do with the um, grand list and the assessment process. Because that, that seemed to be the one, one of the uh, issues that um, people had an interest in based on the little survey, informal survey that we did. So that's what we got. Good. Is there any other business to be brought forward tonight? If not, then we're adjourned. <clears throat>